We're back. We're back live, Michael. Well, technical hitches aside, it's always the way, isn't it? You go live and you've got it all prepared, but when the moment of truth happens, boom, something goes wrong. Grand, the way I look at it is the lights went out at the Super Bowl once. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> they did. They did. In the Superdome, they just, the lights went out. <laughs> Exactly. But the crowd, I mean, the crowd didn't go home, right? They're still here. So. No, they didn't. And as a matter of fact, it was a, it was a um, seminal moment for Twitter because people started tweeting stuff. The brand started tweeting stuff like, hey, the lights are out. Why not go get an Oreo or some such thing? I don't know. I remember. It was really weird. But in the age of, in the age of ubiquitous technology, something bad is always going to happen. You just have exactly. To kind of... But we carried it through. We're back. We're live. Asia Tech Podcast. Graham Brown, Michael Waits, we're talking about the big mega Amazon deal this week. What do we need to talk about? Because that was just all over the news this week, Michael. Well, so Amazon is always the it's the um it's the bellwether for every e commerce company, not just in the United States, but globally. And, you know, they have been trying for over ten years to get into the grocery market. I and mean, a lot of people have been trying, right, for years. It's hard because there's freshness, who's gonna do the shopping? There are a whole bunch of technical and logistic issues in there and it's also 20 percent of retail in the united states is groceries supermarket shopping so it's not small and for a company like amazon that wants to sort of take a cut of every piece of economic activity getting the supermarket and grocery space right is obviously very very important mm. it's kind of like uh, i mean you know people thought amazon was an e-commerce company it was always an online player right so to go back into the offline space did that make sense i mean what's the understanding there what are they playing at well so this is why it's really interesting and i'm glad we're kind of talking about this a week or so after all these announcements took place you know the stock markets for both you know globally reacted for every other supermarket chain but also for the logistics companies that serve the supermarket chain i don't think anybody was really um sure what the impact was and there, there's a lot of stuff to unpack here right, right. so and we can we'll get into instacart i can never remember the name of that company but we can get into instacart later but what is the real impact well what is let's just talk about what is a supermarket well let's back up for a second let's say what is amazon and then we'll get to what this really means right mm. amazon like you say people just think of it as a big online retailer i go i log on maybe i stay logged on and i shop i have my credit card and i get out maybe i'm a prime member if i'm a prime member i pay 99 dollars a year I'm kind of wed to Amazon for all of my online shopping now. Why is that? Well, I've already paid, psychologically, I've already paid $99 for, depending on where I live, free delivery, two-day delivery, one-hour delivery, depending on the services that I'm supposed to be getting for that. And I also get video on demand through my Prime subscription. So all these things, they're trying to combine things that every other company does. Mm. And they've got a business model, right? We can. I like to talk about this in the context of the business models, right? And I think if you look at some of the things that have been written, um, like by Ben Thompson or by Scott Galloway, people have spent a lot of time analyzing these companies over time, not just because of this deal. But this deal is a great way for all of these opinions to manifest themselves, right? And we will talk later about how this has international impact as well. But let's talk about the United States first and our view on that from Asia. Okay. okay, yeah. So, if you look at what the, if you look at what Amazon's businesses are, right, go all the way back and say started as an online bookseller. Bezos did this because it was the easiest way with the least competition to try to get online and and get into retail. And over time, they went into every other category, and then they also started building a marketplace for others to participate in online retail, and that seemed to work okay, right? So they created this massive online mall. And their business is probably split 50-50 between things that they sell and things that other sellers sell on Amazon. And to be fair, there are plenty of individual sellers, corporate sellers that just sit on Amazon, use the platform, um, and make a living off of that. That's one piece of it. But when they did that, they realized that for them to scale, any of the businesses or the business lines or the verticals in which they exist – or existed, they needed an incredibly powerful and um, flexible infrastructure on which to build that business. Mm. Okay, and now we're really starting to get into the detail of what Amazon really is. Okay, so they realized when they were building this infrastructure, they would sit around, and I've, re I've done a lot of reading 
on this, right? So when Bezos and his senior management would sit around and say, look, we need to build an infrastructure on this because we're coming out with different verticals often. Some of them work. Some of them don't work. But we want to be able to plug things in and out seamlessly. In other words, we want to be able to start not just a new business, but a new business strategy and a new business tactic without having to change our entire back end or rebuild it from scratch. And that was really the genesis of their AWS business. Mm. Now, AWS, if you think about it, stands for Amazon Web Services. Now, it makes sense, right? Because everything that Amazon does is based on a web-based backend. And they said, how can we build our business? And, and let's, let's attribute where attribution is really necessary, right? So Ben Thompson, the guy who runs a, a business called Stratechery, is very good at putting you know, your really high-level thoughts into, into detail and, and into words that most people can, can understand. So he talks about all of their back-end services as primitives. I just like to talk about them as components. But when he says primitives, he's talking about the same thing that I am when I say components. Mm. And when I look at the way he draws this business out, it's a horizontal bar with two sides of it. One side is the, the, the component side, right, and the other side is the customer side. And you can literally erase the terminology inside the boxes and put almost any successful web-based or scalable business in there. And I love the fact that um, he and I have kind of developed this same thought process completely independently. I don't know him. I've never spoken to him. And this is, the, this is this, probably the second time that he's put this out on the web that I've seen. But the point is that you build this infrastructure, right, to take advantage of a massively fragmented business. And you take those individual fragments, you build them into primitives or components, and then you can plug in different parts of your business into it. Why does this matter? Well, when Amazon built this backend for themselves, mm -hmm. they said, well, now that we've built all of this <clears throat> um, capacity, what are we going to do with what now is, and this is back in the day, right, probably 10 or 11 years ago, what are we going to do now with all this excess capacity? So all of the servers that they custom built for themselves, all of the customized services, all of the flexibility and dynamism that they built into their S3s and their EC2s and all their backend servers, right? their data centers, the storage, all the switches and bandwidth and stuff that they use on the backend, now that we have it in a component format and we make it dynamically flexible, let's offer those services to other people, mm. other businesses, Right, and and they did something else that was really smart, and I wondered why. So far, at least I haven't. I don't know. Have enough detail. On, I wonder why they never built a an investment business around this, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, so they built this AWS business, right, and they started offering those services to other people. It's one of their largest businesses right now, and it's it continues to grow, and it's been copied by Microsoft, right, and by Google. And even Apple's starting to get into this business a little bit. But the bottom line is that they built a comp componentized, primitive style, primitives business where they can just plug things in and plug things out as they need more capacity. Okay? But the thing that they learned here is, and this was brilliant at the time and even more brilliant in retrospect, was that they were their first biggest customer. Okay? And they put it on themselves. We did this as well with e-commerce and what we called the what's new business. We, we, we built a, um, an e-commerce facilitation business and plugged in our own vertical just to test it. Okay, mm -hmm. I, don't like this con I don't like this word dog fooding because I think it's kind of stupid, but the idea is you use your own services first to figure out if they work, and that's what Amazon did with AWS. And you'll see how this fits into Whole Foods probably in, in a few minutes. Okay, But the point is that they did that, it worked, and then they figured out that this model for business is actually applicable to other businesses. And they learned over the past 10 years how to take something, break it down into its components or primitives, and then build it in such a way that it gives flexibility and also knowledge and data and stuff to them, but also to people that use the same business model and use their, use their capacity to build out their businesses. But remember, when Amazon first started selling books and even CDs back in the day, they used other people's warehouses. So they never took on in any inventory. And even if they did, they left that inventory in somebody else's warehouse. And now you know that Amazon has some of the most sophisticated warehouses, some of the most automated warehouses in the whole world, and some of the most automated gizmos that kind of feed into those warehouses as well. 
Right? But basically what they did was they took a warehouse, did the same thing they did with AWS or vice versa, and said, what are the basic things that we need to run a, a great warehouse? What are the components? How do we build those out? How do we make them as flexible and dynamic as possible? With humans, with robots, it really doesn't matter to them, right, at all. But how do we do that and then build the most flexible business possible and allow other people to plug into it too? My, I surmise that 50% of the sellers that sit on Amazon probably leave their products in Amazon's warehouses as well. Yeah. And that allows them to make their one-hour delivery, two-hour delivery, two-day delivery much more efficient because the products are already sitting in there. They don't have to drop ship, right? So Amazon doesn't have to send somebody to their place to pick it up and then ship it to somebody else. That's the, the nature of drop shipping. Mm. So basically what, what they've done is they've, they've done the opposite of what so many companies did before them, which was, you know, we talked about Webvan as an example, right? Yep, yep. Amazon said, right, how can we solve this problem that we have in our business? They went about solving the problem in the way that they know how by compartmentalizing that problem and looking at each of those primitives. Then they solved it. Then they realized, actually, there's a lot of businesses out there that could also benefit from this solution, right? Correct. And that's the key, right? And remember, it's a long game for them. But that's the other key about Amazon, too, right. is that because the CEO and the founder is still one of the biggest shareholders, they are allowed to have a completely long view. They don't need to have profits or make a ton of money mm. at any particular point in time. And the stock market believes it. That's a, another topic altogether but they have a long view on everything so as they're building out this aws business they learned all these really important lessons about how to take a business break it down into its components and then learn how to make it as flexible and as scalable as possible and in combination with all the warehouses that they put throughout the united states they also learn how to make that as efficient and dynamic as possible as well so now let's fast forward okay you have an ex-Amazon employee, right, what's his name, Apurva Mehta, who is, I think, only 30-something years old, right? He worked at Qualcomm. He worked at BlackBerry. And again, this is a guy who just had technical interest. He was a technologist. He just wanted to sort of hone his skills in a bunch of different places. Mm -hmm. And the last job he had before he started Instacart was – at Amazon. So he learned a whole bunch of things from Amazon, right? Super smart guy, went out and tried a bunch of different things, and he settled on groceries, the delivery of groceries, the service of groceries, and he went out and he started Instacart. And you'll see the way this conversation for Instacart, Amazon, and Whole Foods all comes together, right? But you have to understand the background first of both of these things to understand why this whole thing is so significant. And then in the end, let's try to figure out why and how it's significant, at least from our point of view, for what's going on in Asia, right? Mm. Because because I think that that's an important view that we have here. So, go ahead. I was just going to ask. I mean, is, we're on the subject of Amazon. You, we have. I mean, you've mentioned Jeff Bezos just indirectly. I'm curious to know before we sort of think about the alternative, you know, the implications of this for Asia. And I suppose it is, you know, the implications for Asia. Why is it that Amazon has managed to achieve this when there are so many other companies out there that had similar backgrounds and they had you know visionary leaders who had flexibility to be able to grow a business without delivering profit in the short term medium term and so on what is it that you think that amazon did right i mean i know he came from a different background he was an investment guy right he was an investment banker right yeah what do you think that they did right that the other companies have missed out on because i'm curious to know because that will then replay out in asia yeah i mean to be fair bezos was so early Right, so early. It started in 1997 or 1998. I can't remember exactly when Amazon was founded, right? 97. So that was, what, 20 years ago? Is that yeah, my exactly. math right? Yeah, 20 years, 20, yeah. 20 years ago. Um, you know, he wanted to be the largest bookseller. What did he do right? He just had one, like, undying focus and passion to build the best e commerce company really the best retail sales company or the best economic entity in the world. And he never stopped. And he never let the, very, the vagaries of the stock market get in his way. And he never let the insults get in his way. And he was just laser-focused internally 
on building an amazing team too, right? So the tech was really important from the get-go. And his senior management team has been pretty stable over time. And they have all, obviously, those senior people have been extremely well rewarded financially. But the whole concept is he was really early. He's been right. He's made mistakes. We can talk about yeah. the fire phone, right? Which was a complete flop. Yep. But it's just like everything you do in your regular life, right? Like you can try to do one thing, but it leads to another thing. So the fire phone, all the testing, all the components, all the sourcing, all that stuff went in to build that was a complete dud, but now they have Alexa. Right. And it's right. back, isn't it? It's Alexa with a screen now. So it's come it's back through the, the back screen. door, right? It's Alexa with a screen. It's Alexa on the refrigerator. If you yeah. talk about the wand, it's Alexa video, like you said. It's, it's Alexa everywhere. And it's right. Alexa now being licensed to third parties to be able to use that voice technology. And remember, it really just started as a way to, hey, what's the weather? Hmm. Hey, please buy this thing for me. There's Alexa, there's the dot, right? There's the echo, sorry, then there's the dot. Then there's the thing you can literally put on your refrigerator. You press the button and it orders things for you right away. The, um, the, th the thing about him is he's never been complacent and he's been innovating over time. So what he's done actually in the retail sales space, in the e-commerce space, is very similar to what Steve Jobs and Apple did in the electronic device yeah, space. For sure. So you can, you can make the equivalency and say, you know, a company that was selling iPods hand over fist never should have turned the iPod into a piece of software and put it onto a phone when you had no idea whether that phone was ever going to sell even remotely as many um, units as the iPod did, but they did that anyway. Mm. And the idea was, if you feel like you can see the future, and if you feel like you're going to be disrupted, and Amazon has done this multiple times, just keep doing it and keep investing too, right? So, And other companies have given up and sold. So if you want to say, Sure, the people that did diapers.com and even um, Tony Say who did Zappos, they all saw little pieces of the market that were available, mm -hmm. right, market gaps. They took them, but they didn't have the drive and the ambition to be the biggest. Otherwise, they wouldn't have sold their businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, this is such a long conversation, but we could say that Amazon could have been the Microsoft of e-commerce, right, in the sense that, Every, you know, Microsoft did this with the browser, with mm -hmm. the spreadsheets, with Microsoft Office. They went out and tried to buy and build all these companies. And yet, the people that were competing against them just didn't give up, and Microsoft got bloated, right? Yeah. And, and the leadership was myopic, right? It was all Windows all the time. It took, it took getting rid of Bomber, who was brilliant. No questions about it, right? And getting rid of Gates, who was a visionary for sure. But you needed kind of younger, more dynamic leadership in there to make sure that that company would – if you had left the existing leadership in there, they never would be where they are today, which is now a much more dynamic company. But Bezos has never taken his eye off the ball, and he's never been complacent either. And like I said, he's always had a long vision for where he wanted to be. And he said for years – you know, his almost like Warren Buffett-like letters to his employees and to his shareholders, we're in the first inning mm. of a very long game. And I think a lot of the people that, like Jet, right, recently sold to, um, to Walmart, and these guys wanted to disrupt Amazon too. But the reality is that he's not in it for the money at any level. He's just in it because he wants to win. And this is the difference between people that are super, visionary and are going to survive forever and people that are just out trying to make a buck right they mm -hmm. just see a market gap and trying to make money but the difference there is just this completely tight vision and the ability to kind of adapt that vision as technology changes remember they could have been killed by some mobile shopping thing but they didn't let it happen yeah for sure right they adapted to that as well right and as soon as as soon as like it was possible to digitize books they went right into the kindle they didn't let somebody do that to them. When Borders and the other bookstores tried to move into their space, that they didn't yep. let that happen at all. But so all these companies could have done it, but the difference is that he had a long-term vision, and he's basically stuck to it. And as the market changed, he just moved past everybody. Mm. And let's not forget as well the customer service, right? I mean, well, we the haven't even talked the numbers, right? I mean, if Amazon acquires... Well, if Amazon absorbs all the 100,000 employees of Whole Foods Markets, it'll be the second biggest employer in the U.S. Yes, next, next to whom? Walmart. Exactly. Yeah, and Right. And the customer service, 
that it delivers for what half a million employees is just phenomenal. I mean, to be able to get that customer service throughout the whole chain is just, I mean, that is the unsexy part of the business and technology, but that is where the brand is made, right? It is, because you know if you buy something from Amazon and you don't like it or you have any kind of problem, and I've done this, like you said, for the past 20 years, you can get on the phone to somebody yeah. and they'll just say, sure, how can I fix it? Never mind, just send it back. I've yeah. never had a problem. But they were the no. first to do that, right? I mean, you remember back in the day when people were talking about Amazon and saying, wow, I bought something from Amazon, didn't like it, sent it back. And they were like, I think only maybe Sears did that before with their catalog, right? But they had the margins. But this was a company selling books able to do this, right? And people were like, wow. And they deliver in, you know, days rather than 28 days for delivery as it was. I mean, these are things we take for granted now, but we've got to remember Amazon started all that, right? Yeah, I mean, so you can go back to some of the catalog companies, whether, like you said, because Sears started as a catalog company, and then there was Land's End, and then there was L.L. Bean that would take that stuff. But remember, those were very small companies in the context of, um, in the context of total retail sales. Mm. And we should go through this actually a little bit, okay? Because I want to get, I want to get into the, um, what what the point what the whole point was is and the, and the reason for buying Whole Foods and then what that means for the rest of for the rest of the Amazon business how it fits into AWS and also what it means for the rest of the supermarket business and also it, we didn't finish the conversation on Instacart but let's talk about Amazon. Are we going to get all of that in, in an hour, Michael? And then we've got to talk about Asia as well, right? So it may be a little bit longer, but we should have this conversation. I think let's do it. Okay. Um, online retail sales in the United States were about $395 billion in 2016. Those are the final numbers, right? And that's about 8.1% of total retail sales. Think about it. Total retail sales in the United States, only 8.1% were online. And that, that makes total retail sales about $4.8 trillion if you just do 395 divided by 8.1%. Okay, and they grew last year about fifteen point one percent, and something like sixty-five to sixty-seven percent of that growth was due to Amazon's growth. Okay, so of the three hundred ninety-five billion dollars of online sales, Amazon's was about one hundred and fifty billion dollars. Uh -huh. So not yet half, but close enough to be yeah. half. The point is that. They want to. They're they're already dominate, dominating online retail sales in the United States. But again, it's still small, right? If it's only eight point one percent, there's another ninety one point nine percent of things that can get sold online that aren't getting sold online. And that's what Bezos meant when he said he has a long term vision. Okay, let's talk a little. Let's talk a little bit about. Um, so there and there are two things that that aren't included or potentially aren't included there, and it's fuel and cars, we could have an entire show about how that does or doesn't matter. But the bottom line is that the significance of this is large. It also makes sense to say that 20% of retail sales in the United States are groceries. Mm -hmm. So things that people buy, food, toilet paper, things like that, people that are buying groceries every day, um, that's 20% of retail sales. So why does that matter? Well, that's where the, the genesis of Instacart comes. Right? Remember, we talked a little bit before about this guy, Meta, who was working at Amazon, decided that after trying a bunch of different things, that that portion of retail sales was huge, and it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of competition in it, and that it was still being served in a very old-fashioned way. Right? So he came up with this business model where you have an app, you order something from a grocery store, Somebody actually goes and buys it in your place. And remember, there was Webvan, like you said, in the past. There was Pets.com, which wasn't selling pets, but was selling things for pets. Um, but again, there was no mobile back then. Mm. There were no logistic apps, logistics apps, so it was much harder to do. And even he, even the CEO, will tell you, timing really matters when you're developing these companies, right? So he went out and built this, and he must have known when he started doing this um, four or five years ago, or five or six years ago now, that Amazon was going to come and compete in this space, even if he had only worked in Amazon for t only two years, right? But the bottom line is he went out, built Instacart, and he even had Whole Foods as one of his clients. They were slightly less than 10% of his business. Didn't they invest in them? They were about a 1% shareholder in the Instacart business as well. So in no way were they so significant, but he must right. have learned a lot from them as well. And, and you know, I don't have statistics on what percentage of their organic or kind of natural food sales they did, 
but just based on their percentage of those sales offline, there must have been a large portion of that particular vertical inside of Instacart, right? For sure. And let's just loop back around and talk about Amazon's desire to take a percentage of every economic activity to say that it's 20% of, of, um, of retail activity is in the supermarket space and say that Amazon tried to start Amazon Fresh almost 10 years ago and couldn't figure out how to make that business scale. Hmm. Well, now let's talk a little bit about the history of Whole Foods. So if you ask somebody, even somebody who lives in Austin, Texas, which is one of the places where at least one of the initial components of Whole Foods was started, what year it was started? They'll probably say like 2002. Right. Because most people, this organic thing is like, it's new. Yeah, it was way before that though, right? It was like 1979. Yeah, I see the picture of the founder. He's like some hippie dude who's like, you know, a lot <laughs> from the 70s, right? He's really from the 70s. He was he was wearing bell-bottom pants when he founded this and hip huggers, you know, yeah. like it was a long time ago. And the point is that they have a ton of experience in building this business out and they understand retail on the supermarket and on the grocery side and basically what Amazon did was they waved a white flag. Okay? And they said we give up in the grocery space, but we're going to spend 3. Point, I mean 13.7 billion dollars buying somebody who knows this space inside and out. Now let's talk about how that's similar and what they're going to do now mm-hmm. and how that's similar to the AWS business. Well, now that they have a supermarket business, let's just talk about what a physical store is, right? There's this been this concept in online retailing, right? So Bonobos has done this. Um, Warby Parker has done this where they start online and then they open up a flagship store somewhere so that people can actually come in and touch the things that they want to buy. Now, in a grocery market, people want to touch the tomatoes and touch the pineapples and look at the avocados, right? Because today is not the same one you want to buy if you're going to use it in three days but don't have time to type of thing. Mm-hmm. And because most of the products in a grocery store are perishable, Amazon was losing a ton of money there, you know, that was chilled. And anything they didn't sell, they essentially had to either throw away or give away. But whatever it was, it was right. So they said, let's just take stores that already have sales mm-hmm. ways, and let's conceptualize Whole Foods in the same way that we conceptualize the AWS business. Right? And so let's think about each one of their stores in their component pieces. Let's break it down into the supply chain for each one of the products that they have, or at least each one of the vertical product categories that they have. Let's think about it in the context of every single one of their stores sits in either an urban or suburban area, and the reason why that store is there is because it services a population that's big enough to warrant having that store there. And then let's back out all of the sort of categories that they have and all the titles that fit in, so all the names of the products. Let's just erase them all and think about these things in generic terms. And now we're back to Ben Thompson's primitives, my components, mm. and that horizontal line or that horizontal box that gets drawn and says, okay, can we plug that into the AWS model and can we make Whole Foods our first customer in the grocery space? Wow. Now remember, Insta- right, so, so that's, and that's the brilliance of those business models and not to put such a tight point on it, but you and I have been talking about this for six months or maybe nine months now and that is what are the businesses in which I like to invest? Right? I wanted to sort of make this equivalency as well and that is I like these businesses that have a horizontal platform that other things can plug into because as long as those things plug in properly, if they do work, that's great. If they don't work, you plug something else in. And that's the same thing that Amazon's been doing with its AWS business. Right? They're taking a fragmented market like grocery stores that are all over the country, not really connected necessarily, and they're plugging it in to a similar model as AWS. So they're taking all the things they learned in a pure technology bits and bytes business mm. – and putting it into a brick and mortar space and saying, how can we combine those two things together and build a massive moat around that as well? But you see how that now comes full circle and all the things that they've learned in a purely tech business now feeds into an offline business. 
Go Maybe back. Go back over that back. point just again because I think it's really important, Michael. That what you said with Whole Foods being their first customer. Just explain that to us again because I think it's a really key point. Like, okay, it's an investment, but they're treating it as if here's this client that they can plug into this system, right? How does that work? Well, it's the same thing they did with the AWS business. What they're saying is we want to be in the grocery business because it's 20% of retail. So let's, the same way we're going to build customized servers, the same way we're going to build um, modularity, and the same way we're going to build flexibility and dynamism into that business, we're going to look at what Whole Foods has already done. We're going to take their individual components and we're going to try to see how we can use those components, first of all, for ourselves. So at some point, maybe they change the name of Whole Foods to Amazon Fresh or vice versa. But now that's their first customer for their distribution and for their right. potential dominance in the grocery space. And that's their entree. They tried before, but this is their real entrance now into the grocery and supermarket market because the cash that gets thrown off the same way that Amazon itself was the first customer for the AWS business, Whole Foods is now going to be the first customer for their ability, because now that they own it, now they can test things with it. They can try drone deliveries, which we can talk mm. about. They can try um, changing the types of technology, both mobile and warehouse-style technology, that the people that actually do the shopping use. And again, they can gather all the data that's associated big, with that. Big data, yeah, exactly. And and combine that with everything else that you're purchasing. And I'm telling you, that data with the book data and the yep. video data it all comes into single sign-on, right? Exactly. Because, because right now you'll log into Amazon. You'll do your whole food shopping. You'll do your video shopping. You'll do your um, just regular Amazon shopping. And it's yep. all going to look like just one big monolith to you. But in the end, it's going to be a whole bunch of different verticals and a whole bunch of different primitives and components. But yeah, they're, they're going to make Whole Foods their first customer, and they're going to learn and grow from that. And it's put like the fear, the deep fear into the rest of not just the retail market, but in specifically like the rest of the supermarket market, yeah, yeah. right? So anybody that's not associated with them. But, but again, Amazon doesn't always win, right? But that, they want to use the same model and the same learning that they've used in the past, particularly with their AWS stuff to try to grow this out. Now, let's think about what they're going to do with, a, with the physical stores. Because I think this is where we can start to show how this can have global impact, right? Mm -hmm. That is, as I was saying before, pick any sort of urban and suburban region. And if there's a whole food supermarket there, what it means is that there is already a population there that can support that. Right? So that population has a certain... Um, net income or gross income, income level. They live in a certain type of neighborhood. They have certain shopping habits. But that Whole Foods is like a big warehouse. Hmm. It already has product in it, and it's already close enough to, to – it's in proximity to where the shoppers are anyway. And, all you, and they're already potentially using Instacart to shop at other supermarkets. Right. You can now steal them away from that, potentially – You've got to be able to replicate that service, right? This guy, Meta, that, um, that built this business knew this was coming, so he's built incredible customer service into his business as well. But the idea that, that they can now take this as a test bed for hour delivery, 30-minute delivery, drone delivery, means it could change completely the landscape of the supermarket and, and the grocery business, yeah? So it's giving them a physical beachhead in every town across the u.s and of course across the world shortly that has over a certain amount of population before that they were simply an online retailer with a lot of you know distributed distribution centers right that hub and spoke right. model but now they have these beachheads in each of these towns it's kind of like now they have these sort of very localized spokes i mean hubs right that they can spoke out yep. from exactly and remember amazon had already been testing the amazon go stores Right, and those Amazon Go stores were almost like little convenience stores where they were testing technology to see if people could walk in, <clears throat> not have cashiers, mm -hmm. where people could pick up three items with an app and then just walk out of the store, pay for it automatically using their Amazon account, and just, again, have a seamless shopping experience. But now, 
right? So they were going to offline already. But now what they're doing is they can use that entire infrastructure of Whole Foods and all their existing clients and say, we're going to make your experience even better. And they can test in individual places and then they can roll it out to each one of those stores. And then they, it may be the case over time. Think about this. No one's talked about this. And this was in none of the things that I read, but I've seen this coming for a long time. Right? So Amazon builds big warehouses. They're mm-hmm. super automated, but they're not actually conducive to people to going into them, to consumers actually going inside their warehouses. Right. So what they're trying to do now, I would think, and I know, like, believe me, if I were as smart as Jeff Bezos, we would be talking about this from my yacht, right? Yeah. And we're not, and we're not doing that <laughs> yet. We'll get there. Next, next, next recording <laughs> from the yacht. But the point is that you know he sees this, mm. right? Again, he first started with books and said, we'll just use existing warehouses. Then he went out and built warehouses in places where delivery was fast, efficient, you know, overnight. Now he's thinking about how can I get to drones and how can I do things that are really efficient, combining that with how can I take a little piece of every economic activity. I contend, and I will pause it again, that people do want to leave their houses, hmm. right? But if you make now a warehouse into a store, but automate that whole process anyway, where you can just walk into a place that's beautiful you can get a cup of coffee. You can get a donut. You can sit down and have a piece of pizza. Now you're talking about not just taking whole foods and bringing it into the Amazon um, umbrella, but now you're talking about any physical shopping space. You can call it a mall or you can call it an experience space or whatever you want. But imagine now going to do laser tag um, at some suburban mall right in Ohio. Or go out to get pizza, but while you're doing that, you sit there and do your shopping on an app. You time it perfectly so that, and you're already in the place where you can maybe walk around, but you don't want to deliver it yourself. So you go into the store, you press a few buttons on your phone, right. you finish eating your pizza, you drive home, it gets delivered into your house or it's delivered into your car. But that whole thing is now Amazon now owns every individual piece of retail in the whole country because they've tested with their first customer, Whole Foods. Right, but imagine now that every warehouse is no longer just a bland mm. sort of generic building, but it's now an experience place where every piece of retail is going to take place anyway, online or offline, and they own that whole experience. Is that, what do you think of this, Michael? A fr- thinking about Whole Foods as that place of experience, a friend of mine in California said that Whole Foods was the best place to get a, a find a date he would regularly go to whole foods because he said he could bump into women of a certain caliber absolutely and, and you know i laugh about it when i think about this but there's a serious side to that as well because if you think about you know what jeff bezos is buying into right you know and you talk about the experience you know once you have that kind of environment where you know it's not a mcdonald's Yep. You know, you're going into a space and you could easily now create a space in Whole Foods where you could do all the kind of things that you talked about, right? Because there's that trust there. There's a certain type of customer there. There's a certain experience. People go there. They're relaxed. They get a very positive experience. You know, he's buying into that, right? And that what doesn't come from just buying any kind of retail. He's been very considerate about who's picked for this, right? For sure. Look, I used to say... You know, you can go into a bar, or on, and I'm going to use New York as an example, right? But you can use Tokyo or Berlin or London or any big city, Sydney. It doesn't matter to me, right? But you can go into a bar on the Upper West Side and and actually meet your wife or your husband because the mere fact that you're in that bar means, means that you can actually afford the drink in that bar. Right. And it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. That's not the point. The point is you understand the socioeconomic structure inside of that environment. And the same thing is true for Whole Foods. Like it's the same thing as true for a Nike store. If you're inside a Nike store up on the third floor in the weight area, you know that the people that are there are cross training, mm-hmm. right? So they fit into your whole concept of like how you want to live your life. And yeah, you want to have a date with someone who who is already thinking what you're thinking and already lives the same way you live. You can just go to a place where those people congregate, and whether that's a bar or a supermarket that sells organic food. What's the difference, really? Mm. IKEA did this, right? 
I mean, at the end of every Ikea, you walk through kind of like that stupid little loop in Ikea, right? I'm sure everyone's been in it. At the end, they sell you food and drink. Yeah. Right? And that's because you probably have kids if you're in an Ikea. If not, you're probably pregnant or thinking about having kids. When you get to the end, you're just like, let's sit down and have some food. And all the people that are shopping in Ikea are from a certain socioeconomic background for the most part, yeah? Again, I'm generalizing, but the point is, sure. But the larger point is that retail is now going to move from just online Mm. to everywhere. Everywhere is going to be potentially a retail space because now that delivery and shopping can be seamless – Because technology now allows it, I think you're actually going to see a reverse. So Amazon may go out and actually start buying physical malls and retrofit them to fit into their infrastructure. Mm. And I think Whole Foods is just the beginning of this. And I think that's the thing that most people are missing. I think that's what Ben Thompson's trying to explain, right? And I think, excuse me, um, that that that's what the article that that you posted in, in the New Yorker was trying to explain as well. Right. Because we've got, we got to stop looking at them as like online retailers, offline retailers, because now it's not making any no sense to make a distinction, right? No difference. Because a physical store itself is really just a place to hold product. And what's the other equivalency for a place that you're going to hold a product? It's just a warehouse. Right. So now that warehouse now becomes an experience place. where Because remember, the one thing that online shopping misses is the social aspect. And when I say mm-hmm. social, I don't necessarily mean fun. You see this happen all the time in stores still. So that's in a shopping place, right? You're just sitting there looking at a pair of sneakers. And the same thing that happens offline happens online. But offline, it may be actually more powerful. right? So you know this. You, you do triathlon training. Mm-hmm. So you're trying to figure out what are the best shoes, what's the best gear, what's the best heart rate monitor, what's all this kind of stuff, right? Should I wear this kind of swimsuit? What should I do? But if you're sitting there in a store looking on, looking at the products, you're like, if there's a guy or a gal sitting next to you, it's likely that they're also training. Mm-hmm. What kind of socks do you use kind of thing? And sure, you can look online, but I think that people like to interact with other people. I've said this to you before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not, I don't disagree with you on that fact. I think you know that's why brands like Starbucks do so well in this sort of digital age, right? Because they have that kind of analog service, right? People to people. Exactly. So, whereas, you know, I know we talked about it on the automation side, there is a role for automation, but I see automation as supporting that frontline interaction. Automation is exactly what Jeff Bezos is doing, right? Automate right. So they're warehouse gonna, to support the front end. Right. So they're going to automate that warehouse and then they're going to move all of that automation into retail spaces so that that retail space may not have as many humans in it working the cash registers, but maybe they're just doing superior, insanely good customer service, right? And Apple kind of pioneered this with the the genius bar yeah 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 for sure those people didn't sell you anything but they definitely did add value to that store people went in and said how do i fix this how can i install um final cut how do i do that thing so maybe and this gets back to a conversation again we had before but i want to loop this all in right and why this is significant we talked about cafe x right yep x is the automated coffee maker Their whole concept, if you listen to them, is not to unemploy a whole bunch of people. Their whole concept is to take those people from doing things that a machine can do and to make them do things that a machine can't do, which is to create a social environment where people will stay around and buy coffee and buy more coffee. Yeah. So that's the whole thing. So I think this is much bigger than Amazon just buying Whole Foods. I think it's Amazon trying to figure out how to do online to offline retail in a business that's already throwing off a ton of revenue and a ton of cash that already has what I'll call warehouses but are physical stores in places and trying to see how that works. So, And again, being their first customer, to try to figure out how that business's individual components fits into the horizontal layer and then they can say, how can we do this for other retail businesses? But remember, this is the really the only part of the retail sales, either online or offline, in which they were not dominant. We can talk about cars under separate cover because cars is a separate business. Most people don't know this, but highly regulated. Right? If you follow Tesla at all, you know you have to have dealerships, although Tesla's found a way around this. But the car market is just completely different. And we talked about this over an hour ago, but I think you'll find a situation where cars themselves could actually end up being commodities yeah except except at the super high end 
right? In the same way that phones were given away so you could get your contract, cars could be given away in the same way because they're just mobile data centers. I could spend hours talking about that. Let's not do that yet. But let's spend a little bit of time now that we've gone through the business models, the impact on the United States and stuff. Like, yeah. why do we care? Just when before we, we can, can I just ahead. ask you a question? I just want to Please. switch gear, gears a little bit because I, I want some kind of feedback from the audience. They can tweet us on this. But just before we talk about the bigger picture for Amazon and the implications for Asia and why we care here on Asia Tech Podcast, sure. I want to know if it's physically possible to go into a Whole Foods market and spend less than 200 bucks. <laughs> Is it possible? I mean, every time I've been, I don't know about you, Michael, but I've been in there just with the family and I think, right, we're just going to buy a salad. <laughs> End of story. And Tweet us at Asia Tech Pod. We want to know the answer. I'd like to know. I, I have not been in the Whole Foods, yeah, in a really long time. So I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> All right. Why do we care? Why do we care about Amazon and the, the Whole Foods deal? Well, I mean, we care about it, like in general, just because of the business model. We're very interested, obviously, in the online to offline concept. We're interested, actually, at a much higher level because of the components and like we said, as Ben Thompson talks about the primitives and just that whole horizontal model taking a fragmented market and consolidating it into one. We talk about this in almost all cases. Mm. But the question now is what happens in Asia, right? So Alibaba, which is the elephant in the room almost everywhere, you have Rakuten in Japan, Zozo Town, Yahoo Japan, Lazada you, Lazada, you see a lot of competition in India with Flipkart and Snapdeal going against each other, then merging or not merging. And then on the high end, you have Zalora, which is another rocket internet company, which was bought at least in Vietnam and Thailand by the Central Group, and then recently rebranded um, to Luxie. But the question now is, how are they going to learn from that model, right? So a, country, a company like the Central Group is the perfect, they have the perfect opportunity to do this. It's a multi-billion dollar company, three generations of understanding retail, connectivity to Every major brand, not just in the region, but in the world, right? You want to buy Ralph Lauren? Go into Central Embassy. You can't get it anywhere else. And frankly, you couldn't even get it there until a couple of years ago. But they have the scale, right, and the power and the resource to, to be able to build this, and no one's really built it yet. Remember, you can't, at least not that I know of, go into a physical store in China and buy something from Alibaba. Now, you may be able to use WeChat to buy it, but no one's done this on, offline to on, I mean online to offline yet. No, yeah. yeah. But, but the central group has the opportunity to do this. And now, I mean, the Matahari Mall, right, also has the opportunity to do this in Indonesia. So they're watching this really closely because they've been trying to build a digital business. But they have an opportunity now if they can see this. And we were talking about this to them, to be fair, three or four years ago, saying you have warehouses, you have stores that can act as warehouses. Right, The warehouses get fed from the port, they feed the stores, the stores feed people that come into the stores, but wouldn't you rather have an entire ecosystem that's digitally driven, mobile first, and can then serve product to people at any point in any time? Right, So you build lockers on the subway or on the BTS, which is the sort of L-style train in Thailand, and how do you use that model to then dominate retail for the next generation. And that to me is why this type of acquisition is so important because we say it a lot and we'll, and we'll continue to say it. We can see the future here, right? And in the same, I was having a conversation with somebody about this on the funding side too. It, it may be the case that every business that grows, at least in Southeast Asia, if not in Asia overall, kind of leapfrogs a lot of the steps and stages that took place in the United States, mm. right? So if, if the GDP per capita and the growth of GDP per capita in the United States meant that individual malls in small towns across the United States and across, you know, Canada were built because back then there was no online retail, if that's why those spaces were originally built, then they don't have to get built necessarily today. But if there's a physical building where there's a warehouse or you're thinking about building a distribution center in Southeast Asia, why not just build that physical retail space where you can have the experience so leapfrog the whole model mm -hmm. and then just build that instead, but just don't build it as just don't build as many so you don't overbuild like like has happened in the United States, right? Mm. But to me, that business model alone and be able to learn from all the things that Amazon has done, because remember, 
Amazon is doesn't exist. Like I can't I can't order um, from Amazon in Thailand or Amazon in Singapore and have like one hour delivery. Right? I can't do it. It doesn't exist yet. And even Alibaba hasn't mastered that. And even with all the work that they're doing with Lazada, that hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened with Flipkart and Snapdeal in India. And Rakuten, which was, I mean, and give Mikitani all the credit in the world, right? But no other business that those guys have built except their travel business has been really successful. Mm-hmm. So the question now is what can Asia learn from that acquisition? And at any level, can they prevent Amazon from coming out to these countries without kind of government interference? Because the models that they're employing in the United States are really, really unique. Hmm. So what's going to happen out here? I think that's the reason why I like to look at this stuff is what's the combination that happens here, right? Does Alibaba go out and buy? Because there is no overriding physical retailer in China. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 even, it's even more fragmented and even smaller. Like, uh, there are still shops in Bangkok where people are selling, you know, four cans of Coca Cola and yeah. chips. And, and that's great, right? Because we know even in Japan that still exists. You go into a small town in Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're everywhere. But, and the, it, but then, you know, the, so, the, the size of the, the e commerce market in the, the e commerce retail market in Asia, right? Well, I mean, that's fifty percent of. Doesn't it? Asia is equals the U.S. plus Europe together. So, I mean, there are those grandma shops, but at the same time, I mean, I know a lot of big portion of that is China, right? But you know, there's a huge space here. But does yeah. it have the kind of visionaries? I mean, you know, Jack Ma is probably the only person that I know who can kind of think on the same kind of level as Jeff Bezos, right? Right, and again, he's had that whole market to himself. And in combination with a couple of other companies, whether it's been Tencent or, or WeChat, um, you know, they've done all the innovative stuff there. The question really for me is, who's going to step in and iterate on that business model so that there's some local and nuances that are taken up here in Southeast Asia and in Asia in general to make sure that that offline to online works, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I look at, I look at this all the time. Right, so there, there's so far no one who's trying to master that business to say every physical retail space can actually be a warehouse for product. And how do I, how do I incorporate that into my infrastructure and make and either buy it or partner with it to make sure that everything that gets bought goes through my pipes? But do you have to think about it differently as the, as the way a retailer would be trained? You know, you're talking about making that space – something which they don't see it as, right? I mean, they've grown up through years and years of training in retail and they've seen that physical space as what it is right here, right now, but you're saying it's something else, right? So is that something that comes naturally to them? Because Jeff Bezos is not a retailer, right? So he hasn't come with that legacy, right? I don't think so. And to be fair, like, I think you can be, um, you can be slightly disappointed that when Matahari Mall was, conceptualized two or three years ago, they didn't take all of their existing warehouse spaces and say, instead of turning them in, instead of building retail spaces, we're going to build more warehouses, mm. right? And, and the central group does some interesting things too, but you know, they just built a multi-billion dollar mall and didn't do anything in that particular retail space to make it um, sort of online efficient or online available. And, and again, you have to understand this whole concept of the existence of capital and the existence of risk capital. Two completely different things, right? This gets back to a concept that I like to talk about a lot, and that is I have the money to spend on building something out. Am I going to build it in a way where I know what my return is, or am I going to build it in a way that's slightly more risky, but the potential upside is 40 times as opposed to 12% annually, right? So the concept here is hopefully people will see this and it'll light a fire under their feet and they'll say, look, that's a great idea. We already own all the retail spaces. We just bought one of the biggest online companies. How can we put those things together? And the next time we build a retail space or we renovate a retail space, we turn that space into our warehouse. We're already putting product in there anyway. And whether you, because they tried to do this at Big C years ago, right? But they didn't have the, the tech in place. So they tried to say, um, if you buy something online, We'll just literally take it off a shelf in our store and deliver it to you. 
but but they didn't have the ERP system in place or the warehouse management system in place that would then let them understand what what inventory they had. Mm-hmm. So the stuff would just leave the shelves and they wouldn't know where it went. So they have to build that technology too, right? But the beautiful thing is, in the Amazon case with Whole Foods, is that Whole Foods maybe, because 10% of Instacart's business was going through Whole Foods, maybe they'd already start to build some of that infrastructure and understand how to create an inventory space that could use technology and they could track it in both ways, whether people came in and bought it physically or bought it online, how they could combine those two things together. But putting Amazon... Um, in control of that entire process now means that someone's going to show them how to do that. And that gets back to the whole concept of first customer. How can you incorporate offline offline retail, meaning having a physical store, right? Because nothing is really offline anymore, particularly in the United States. Um, but how can you combine that infrastructure together and make it seamless? Another word that I love to use when it comes to shopping with technology. How can that be seamless, right? And and it's funny because if you go and read the history of um, the building of Instacart, the guy said when he first built the model and the um, the first app for Instacart and had one supermarket or whatever his, as his client, he would literally take the app at home, order his own food, right, <laughs> or order his own products, and he himself would physically go down to the store, right, pick it up, tell them that he'd already paid for it online, <laughs> and deliver it to himself at home. Yeah. As a test, right? So that's how long people have been working on this. But if Amazon can can show that they can do this at scale for themselves, right? Because Instacart's been working on this now for five or six years, and then they can learn how to do this as their own first customer. Mm-hmm. What is the what's going to be the result for the rest of the market for the rest of physical retail? I, I think I know what it is, right? And we talked about this: taking those existing retail spaces and instead of just knocking them down and saying that they're dead using them as your distribution center for every individual type of product. And if you want to have a section there that's just Adidas or just Nike or just whatever brand, I think that works, actually. Mm-hmm. Who's going to be the first in Asia to get that, though? Which, which companies have the kind of leadership necessary to make that kind of paradigm shift? Well, I think, it, to be fair, I think it actually has to happen either in India, in China, or in Southeast Asia, I guess that's too general. I, I think the I think the Alibaba guys are potentially going to do it, and I think that that was part of their reason for for buying Lazada. But they don't own any offline retail, so yeah. the question now is, can they go out and do it? Like I really want the Central Group to do this. I really do badly. I don't think it's possible in Japan because because I don't think the way that the infrastructure offline is set up is conducive to having someone like Rakuten buy them. Remember, mm. mergers in Japan like that are probably getting better, but even when I used to sit on a trading desk, we used to see companies try to merge, and it was just really hard to do. They only merge like, when they go bankrupt, right? Yeah, so. Well, that's the point. You see what's <laughs> yeah. happening with, what is it, Toshi, not Toshiba now. I can't remember the name of the company. Oh, the, but, uh, the airbag company, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like really problematic when this happens, right? And then everybody gets involved. It ends up being a mess, but... Here, in Thailand at least, if the central group could definitely do this, I'd love to mm. see them do it. I'd love to see them do it. Um, it's possible, like I said, that the Matahari Mall people could do it in Indonesia, but, but they should have started doing it already since they already have physical yeah. space. I don't know. I think it's something we have to watch and something we'll have to follow up on. But the best, the best possible person to do this, right? they did it in reverse. They bought an online retailer, which was Zalora, changed it to look and they're starting to run some of their high-level brands through it, right? Mm-hmm. So this is kind of the reverse of the whole food deal. And if they can figure out how to take the risk and use their offline stuff to facilitate the online business, I think it's a really good call, actually. Yeah. I mean, as we talked about last week about that transferable knowledge, at the end of the day, you know, if they're able to take risk and they understand what they're trying to achieve here and what the customer wants... And they're thinking about the customer's needs first rather than, you know, let's go and build an automated warehouse for the sake of it. You know, that's what counts. So it doesn't matter whether they're doing a reverse deal or they're coming from online to offline, right? No, well, it doesn't. What matters is if they're constantly thinking about how can we add value to the customer. Like Jeff Bezos says, it's like, you know, back in the day, he was the guy that was saying, you know, we wake up scared of our customers, right? And he right. would instill that in his people, right? That fear right. that a customer could leave at any moment, which was kind of new, wasn't it? A new way of thinking. So 
anybody that has that kind of way of thinking in Asia is really up for the game, right? I agree. And look, we we will say this multiple times again, but like we live in a really unique time because the ability with the type of distribution systems and the logistics systems that are out there means that almost anybody can start a brand. And if that brand can be hyper-focused on serving their clients really well, it can disintermediate existing brands in a way that could never have been done before. Because again, like Amazon did with its componentized and its primitivized system, anybody, if you can plug into that, right? I can use AWS to build my backend. Yeah. I can use a logistics company to build like the middle part of it. And as long as I can build a customer service thing that people trust, getting the product is easy. Because I can contract that product from anybody in China. It's getting that service and owning the customer that's really important, right? So that's yeah, yeah. what Amazon figured out two decades ago. And they built a brand out of nowhere. You can do that right now in Asia, yeah. right? So I can, make, I can make any brand I want, if I'm good enough at it, disappear by giving superior customer service. Because everything else along the stack, somebody else can do for me. Exactly. And I think that's the whole story here, right? Just to get back to the beginning of this conversation, that is, if you build a model around that horizontal disruption and then you plug things into it right and create those primitives and the components any kind of business can get built around that and that's what amazon has proven with this is that they believe in that business model so much they're going to look at the whole foods thing they're going to break it down into its pieces and then they're going to say how can we make this a thousand times better and then how can we use this model to dominate the rest of the retail space mm. and i think there's a lot to learn from that just in um, summary, what do you think of this uh, news? I mean, I suppose it's kind of one of the things that you see a lot of, but it may not actually mean anything. But there was a, a patent filed last month by Amazon. I don't know if you saw this news that they have patented drone delivery towers. So they <laughs> these towers, which they're going to put in urban areas. Can you imagine like your electricity pylons, but it would be an Amazon <laughs> yeah. But I just wonder if it's one of those kind of, you know, we saw about the Amazon drones back on April Fool's or whenever it was or whenever they were, you wonder whether it was, it was legit or not. But it just right. kind of shows that, you know, they're, they're thinking so far ahead of the curve. They're not just thinking, right, okay, how can we make a drone company or an AI company or whatever? They're saying, right, how can we actually get this to these people in an hour? And they're thinking, right, rather than doing it through the guy in the delivery van, let's just build towers. Yeah, I mean, right, what do so, you think? Do you, do you when you see that, do you think that's BS, or do you think this is a, a mark of where are we going? I I don't think it's the end. I think it's the beginning of an idea and a concept, right? So maybe it won't be an maybe it won't be a drone tower. Maybe it won't even be a drone. Maybe it'll just be like an underground pipe that gets built to everybody's house, and every time you order, like it'll be a dumb waiter. You know what a dumb waiter is in a restaurant? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe everybody, maybe every new house that gets built, just like. Who is it? Elon Musk is trying to build his Hyperloop in a yeah. tunnel underneath the ground. Maybe that Hyperloop then gets built, goes underneath everybody's house. It's super silent. There are no fans. It makes no noise. You order a product, boom, it just gets like Hyperloop to your house. Right? So maybe it's not a drone. Maybe it's not in the air. Maybe it's just underground. It just whooshes through. And maybe in the same way, it's so deep, right, that if it goes to your neighbor's house, you don't hear it, but there's a pipe that then comes from the deep underground that's like a ceramic that no one can break into, so there's no thievery. And it just whooshes up into your house, and you press a button, just like the Jetsons, and then you get like your tissues, or you get your avocados. Like I see no problem with that stuff happening, and I have no question that at some level that will happen. I don't think delivery has to happen in the air to be fast and to be fresh. I think it could ha potentially happen underground. But what I do know is going to happen is that Amazon is going to test every single one of those things. Mm -hmm. And if for some reason Bezos talks to Elon Musk and he goes, what are you doing above ground? It's too dangerous. And a drone could kill somebody. But if it's underground in a hyperloop, I already have the right to build these tunnels because Los Angeles has already given me the right to do it. Why don't we test it there? Yeah. I, don't think it's, I don't, don't think it's a leap. Yeah. You, you, people can listen to this and laugh and say, that's insanity. Right, but right. how is that any more insane than... A drone. Right, he's going to say to Elon Musk, hey, look, you know, you're trying to build a Hyperloop? Well, we've solved that problem already for our own company, right? Why didn't you use ours? That's the AWS way of doing things, right? But see, now you, now you get it, right? And I'm not saying you didn't get it before, but now you get it. And that is, why not just build one of those things in Seattle where Amazon's based, build it to Bezos' house, build it to Elon Musk's <laughs> house. Don't tell anybody. 
And while you're head faking everybody, you know what a head fake is, right? Oh, yeah. While you're head faking to everybody, we're going to build a drone tower somewhere. You're digging underground and building. Right, right. It's a distraction. It's a decoy, build. right? Exactly. You're building an individual <laughs> hyperloop to everybody's house. Okay. And then you want a product, you just, hey, honey, do we have any more toilet paper? Give me one second, dude. You press a button and boom, it just shows up. You can laugh, but like, why isn't that possible? Right, right. We're not far away. We're not. You put all those things together so you have tech. Boom, you press that button, whether it's that thing that sticks on your refrigerator. What is it? The wand you were talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just amazing, isn't it? I mean, you're talking about owning the customer. These Asian competitors need to get a move on, right? Because Amazon already has a device on your fridge now, right? I mean, combine that with Alexa. You know, you can see where all these components add together, right? Right. So now let me go back to just one moment of, of me just like talking my own position, right? As an investor in companies and as a mentor to companies, if I came to you and I said, I'm going to take the Hyperloop concept, I'm going to build a delivery system that's completely underground and seamless, I'm going to build it a mile, you know, whatever it is, a half a kilometer below, it's not going to get in the way of anything. And I'm going to use this technology that Musk is doing to do this. Would you invest in that and like seed me the $10 million it's going to take to test that in the most wealthiest neighborhood in Bangkok? Mm. Like that's an idea that I want someone to work on because literally I just came up with that tonight on the phone with you. Right. <laughs> As opposed to me coming to you and saying, hey, I want to build a, um, a photo app where I can put little pictures of a monkey on it and you yeah. talking to that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I like it. I like it. It's the Jetsons. They've made a re they've made a second appearance in your conversations. I think you, you've been heavily influenced, for the better or for the worst. <laughs> Probably for the that, worst. That model is out there. They've obviously had a, an imprint on your your paradigm. Maybe, but it's been amazing. I think it's just. I think we we started. I don't know if we talked about this off air or on tape tonight, but Jeff Bezos probably the most underrated entrepreneur of our age. I know he's no. He's no Steve Jobs. He's no sort of storytelling front man. He's but not. what he's achieved is just phenomenal. And what he will achieve from here on, right? Yeah, I mean, think about it. All we read about in the news today is how Elon Musk is yeah. like the smartest dude ever to grace the planet and the most innovative guy you've ever heard of in the past five years. And yet all he's done is build, okay, PayPal, big deal. Right, but he wasn't alone there. And I'm not saying he's not amazing. He's amazing, right? right? But for like long standing track records, right? In other words, you know, what if you, I guess it's a kind of what have you done for me lately? But if you look at what's happened over the whole body of work, you know, Bezos doesn't like film the landing of his space vehicles the same way that uh, Musk does, but you know, he's out there doing the space, I mean, all this other stuff too, not SpaceX, but he's running his own space exploration thing. And when he does it, he just does it nice and slowly. And if he were as swashbuckling or as charismatic externally as he was internally in his own company, right? Yeah. But you know, and, you know, and Richard Branson is like held up as this great innovator yeah, and stuff. Yeah, exactly. But Bezos has more money, more ideas, and has more staying power than any of these guys. And he does it quietly, deliberately, and considered. And that's kind of my favorite. And he's got all of our credit card numbers. Yeah, and think about it. You're not even American, right? Oh, I mean, still has your credit card. Uh, yeah, he just has a direct line to my salary. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, just like my wife. I mean, I know you talk about PayPal. Now that I think of it, PayPal has obviously had an impact on my life. But for sure. But take Amazon, like with my wife, she's you know, she orders Amazon all the time. You know, there's a daily stream of boxes coming from Amazon to our house, right? Yeah, think about it, if it just came through a pipe. Oh, <laughs> Don't yeah, go no, there. Stop, 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 you might stop. as well just say, look, I just just give them all my salary. You just tell me what I'm having for the year. Just give me everything. All but I'm convinced, I'm convinced though, that people are not going to have their own 3D or whatever 4D printers are in their houses cranking out their own products. No. It's just not going to happen. No, no. Because it doesn't scale. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, when you went back to those sort of visions of the future in the 50s and the 60s, and it was kind of like the honey, I'm home. And she would have, you know, the housewife would like ding and, the you know, she would serve up dinner and it'd be like two pills on a plate. Right. right? right. That's kind of what we thought. But it never materialized. Right. No, nah, that's not going to happen either. No one wants to eat pills. People want to have steak exactly. and raw fish. <laughs> 
Do you I, eat sushi? I mean, we never talked about it. I love sushi. I'm, I'm a sashimi man more than sushi. Cause yeah. The next time I'm in Japan, we got to go out to dinner. We didn't do that the last time. We have to. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, anyway, this was a great conversation. It's gone over a little bit longer. And to be fair, it's getting to the point where almost every conversation we have could go double the amount of time we're having it. Um, but I think I think this is really significant, not just for what's happening in the United States, but from a business model understanding perspective yeah. as well. Um, and now that we've sort of told everybody about this concept of building that horizontal business and plugging in the components and, as Ben says, the, the primitives, people can start looking at businesses in a completely different way and understand why not just Amazon does things the way they do it, but why other businesses could potentially use that model to compete and to thrive as well. Yeah, yeah. So, tweet us your questions, folks. Tweet us your feedback. What do you think of the Amazon deal? What's your take on it? Tweet us at Asia Tech Pod or Asia Tech Podcast hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. We'll pick them up. Even if you're watching this on the archive, you're listening on the podcast, you're watching it on YouTube, you're reading it on the blog. We'll respond. Thanks, Graham.